Ask yourself this question, people. How in the world have you been able to live all these years without Bill Roach on YouTube? Can you believe we're allowed to have this much fun? Today we have a special episode in which we're going to look at probably one of the hottest articles floating around on the internet. Namely, we're going to discuss the resignation of Jordan Peterson. Now, for all of you who live in dark, crusty places where there are sticks and rocks around you and you've never heard of Jordan Peterson, I would advise you to take one of those rocks, pry it off of your pinned down, bonded legs, and come out and see who the world is talking about. We all know Jordan Peterson has taken the world by storm as it relates to these issues and these topics. He's become one of the foremost sort of intellectual prophets of our day talking about what is this movement and the dire consequences of what he calls die diversity inclusion and equity and what i want to do today is i want to look at his key article where he discusses the significance this has upon university life but broadly as it applies to your life in the workplace and in your home and what that might mean for not only this year to come but for decades to come now we're all familiar with the fact that for generations now there has been policies put into place all throughout different universities, different HR programs, where they are trying to hire according to what they might call diversity hires. And we know what this means. It means if there are five positions that they're trying to hire for, three or two or whatever number that they're looking for, whatever quota they're looking for, they have to hire according to those policies. Now, myself being somebody who has a PhD in philosophy, taught at the universities, has been very well exposed to this. We know the reality of what's going on. Now, for some of the people out there, we think that maybe I'm going to be immune from this. But the reality is, is that 2020 and even years prior to that have shown us one thing. There is no place that you can hide from this movie movement. And the reason is, is because all things must bow down to theory. And in this sense, it's critical theory. So what I want you to see here as we look at this, I'm going to pull up some of the key points. And it says this, Jordan Peterson, why I am no longer a tenured professor at the University of Toronto. And here's the key line that I want you to take from this. If you get nothing else from this entire podcast today, it is this. He who sows the wind will reap the whirlwind and the wind is rising. You reap what you sow. Whatever you pour into something, you're going to get out of it. And the reality is this, is that if you live by lies, lies will cause you to live the life you don't want to live. And we've all seen this. We recognize what it does with an individual. But what if we magnify that and we play that out on the university level? Now, I want to speak more directly to what might be my traditional audience here, namely people who are involved within the broader evangelical church. And we act like we're immune from this. We act like our institutions have not been affected by this. But the reality is, is that as we look at these situations, we find that our schools are doing the exact same thing things. We have diversity hires. We might call them kingdom diversity hires, but they're still fulfilling quotas. There's still diversity, inclusion, and equity. And one of the realities is this, is that Jordan Peterson talks about how people who have studied underneath him have almost been unhirable within the university systems. Well, here's the reality, is that this is something that the evangelical church is facing. Do you not think that there are different institutions who don't look at social media, who don't look at what people are publishing and what they stand for and where their convictions lie and that doesn't affect the way that they're being hired or they don't look at who has been your mentors or people who have affected you and influenced your way of thought that that doesn't somehow influence their hires if you think that's the case again go back to your rock that's where we need to go i think if anything i don't say that to be facetious or to be mean to individuals but it's the reality of what's going around 
in the evangelical church because it's what's going on throughout the American society, throughout Western society, and broadly throughout world society. So remember, he who sows the wind will reap the whirlwind, and the wind is rising. Now let's stop right here for one second before we get into the article. If this is something that's appealing to you, that you want more information on, what I want you to do is go to our website, the International Society of Christian Apologetics, because we are hosting a conference on social justice and the evangelical church. It's going to be held in Charlotte, North Carolina at the end of March. You can register there. We're going to have over 20 breakout sessions. We're going to have a plenary session by one of the key thought leaders on this within the evangelical church and actually even beyond the evangelical church. And this is something that I want you to attend. I want you to bring people to. And the reason is, is because if we understand that the 20th century brought the greatest attack against the evangelical church from the hard sciences, I want you to see that the apologetic situation, the issue that the church is facing today in the 21st century is coming from the social sciences. It's coming from critical theory. It's coming from diversity ideology. It's coming from inclusion and equity. Notice I'm not saying equality, but equity, equality of outcome, not looking at merit and value that people are bringing to the situation. So let's dive in here. Let's look at this article. We're going to look at some of the high points and make commentary and application to what this might look like in real life. Now, this article comes from the National Post where Jordan Peterson decided to publish this. Now, you can also go on YouTube and find him reading this article as people are looking through it and trying to decipher what's being said. Now, notice this. He starts off by saying, I recently resigned from my position as full tenured professor at the University of Toronto. I am now Professor Emeritus, and before I turned 60, Emeritus is generally a designation reserved for superannuated faculty, albeit those who had served their term with some distinction. I envisioned teaching and researching at the University of Toronto full-time until they had hauled my skeleton out of my office. I loved my job, and my students, undergraduate and graduate alike, were positively predisposed towards me, but that career path was not meant to be. There were many reasons, including the fact that I can now teach many more people with less interference online, but here's a few more. Now, just think about this. What causes any sane, rational individual to leave their job prematurely? Well, it's situations like this. People in the university system, specifically Jordan Peterson, are feeling the effect of what these diversity hires are doing. As he looks at this article here and why this is so important is it comes down to, do you want to have funding for your department? Do you want to have a fruitful time in the classroom? Do you want to see your students not only graduate, but succeed beyond your classroom. And what he's trying to say here is, is that somebody in his position, somebody who's been teaching at some of the top universities has had to leave because he's no longer able to get grants, teach without the shackles binding him, or see his students find fruitful employment after they leave his classrooms. But notice what he says here. There is a glimmer of hope in this opening paragraph here. He does talk about the fact that he can now teach more people through avenues just like we're doing today. So while it might be dire, we are not finding ourselves in a position where our voices are completely squelched out yet. Notice I said yet. This is a situation that we are finding ourselves in, but let's look at some of his reasons for doing this. He goes on to say this, first, my qualified and supremely trained heterosexual white male graduate students, and I've had many others, by the way, face a negligible chance of being offered university research positions despite stellar scientific dossiers. Now notice what this is coming from. He's trying to say that these are some of the individuals who are at the top of their class. These are people who have put in the hard work. If it's going to come down to what they can bring to the table, they can bring a lot to the table. They bring a lot to the conversation. But what are they facing? He says this is partly because of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Mandates. And my preference is the acronym die. Now, Jordan Peterson's not the only person to use this acronym. You're going to find individuals like James Lindsay, who's also an expert in this field, talking about this as 
die because whatever it seems to touch, it seems to be a cancer. It seems to be some kind of acid that works its way through its subject and whatever happens to that subject, it not only corrodes it, it causes it to die. Now notice, he goes on to say, these have been imposed universally in academia, despite the fact that university hiring committees had already done everything reasonable for all the years of my career, and then some, to ensure that no qualified minority candidates were ever overlooked. My students are also partly unacceptable precisely because they are my students. I am academic persona non grata because of my unacceptable philosophical positions. Now notice this, within diversity and inclusion and equity programs, they're saying we want all viewpoints represented unless you're a conservative. They want all people to be represented there unless you go against theory. All things must bend its knee to theory and your knees cannot bend far enough. And here's the sad reality of it. Even within evangelical churches and within evangelical institutions, we face the same thing, where there are certain professors whose students have a significantly difficult time trying to find employment simply because they are associated with said professor. If you don't think this is the case, track it out. Look at the people who are getting hired. Look at who their major professors were. Some of them are finding it incredibly difficult for this reason. It's because they actually believe what their professors taught them because they follow within the objective, real scientific ideas or within evangelical churches that which the Bible teaches. But the issue that we're running into here is that it makes you persona non grata. You are a person who is not going to find employment because they are trying to not only fulfill diversity hires, they don't want contrary voices being brought to the table. So notice what he says this. He says, these facts render my job morally untenable. How can I accept prospective researchers and train them in good conscience, knowing their employment prospects to be minimal? Do we ever stop to think about that? Do we have a moral responsibility to our students? Is this something that we as evangelicals even more should be talking about? Because we realize this, as evangelicals, our job prospects are already limited. You're not going to be getting full-time tenured positions at Duke, Yale, Harvard, University of Chicago, or the rest. So what's going on is, is we realize it's not only limited, but now we're even starting to find that it's limited within our spheres of influence. And this is something that I think we honestly need to look at individuals and tell them about. Let me give you an example. I've had three conversations this week with people who are trying to find full-time PhDs in philosophy. They're pursuing this academic career. And I tell them outright, you will not be able to find a job in the field. If you do, it will be adjunct external work, most likely. If you are finding full-time work, it's because you probably indebted yourself up to your eyeballs for that position. And you're going to have to do a lot of the things that the people are trying to do here in Peterson's article, namely the way that they're trying to get grants, the way that they have to go along with these different programs. But this is what I want you to see here is that as people are trying to find these jobs, they are not looking at qualifications. What they are trying to do is they are trying to find people to fulfill this agenda. They do not want contrary voices. And Peterson is hitting this right on the head. Now he goes on to say his second reason. The second reason is this. This is one of many issues of appalling ideology currently demolishing the universities and downstream the general culture. Not because there simply is not enough qualified BIPOC people in the pipeline to meet diversity targets quickly enough. Now he goes on to say BIPOC. He's trying to explain it for all the people who don't just live their lives constantly immersed in pop culture and diversity and equity language. He says black, indigenous, and people of color. For those of you not in knowing the woke, this has been common knowledge among any remotely truthful academic who has served on hiring committee for the last three decades. This means we're out to produce a generation of researchers utterly unqualified for the job. And we've seen what that means already in the horrible grievance studies disciplines that combined with the death of objective testing has comprised the universities so badly they can hardly be overstated. And what happens in the universities eventually colors everything. 
as we have discovered. Now, evangelicals have been very prone to recognize that not only do ideas have consequences, but they have origins too. These key thinkers who were brought about in the universities made their ideas very prevalent to the students that were out there, the students that they had before them, who then went out to be the business owners, the CEOs, future academics, and then they started to hire according to those ideologies. We are downstream from many of these ideological views that are hitting society today. But notice what he's starting to talk about here. One of the key issues that he's bringing to the table is what is it actually doing to the quality of researchers we're bringing to the table? Are we actually hiring people who are qualified for the positions? Now, I want to tell you a story about something that went on in a top evangelical seminary that I was made aware of. And in fact, I find it to be one of the most embarrassing things that I've ever seen. But I'm so thankful for what the professor did. So there was an individual who was brought into a Ph.D. program based off of these qualifications. He was given full housing, full stipend. He was given a teaching position at the institution, and he was in a graduate doctoral seminar on the topic within his actual field and he was teaching at the school and what they were called to do was present a standard research paper 25 pages or so fully uh, documented dealing with original research on a particular topic and week in and week out all of his other colleagues had come in and presented Papers that were meeting the qualifications. Well, this individual walks in with six or seven pages of just scattered notes, sets them down and says, so I didn't have enough time to get this done, but I'm going to present to you my research and I'm going to give you my paper at the end of the class as we're done with the semester. And the professor sitting on the other side of the room said, OK, proceed. Let's see what you've got today. And he proceeds to go on and he's discussing his research and he gets about five to ten minutes into the class and the professor stops, he hits the table, slaps his hands and says, class, we are dismissed today. And he looks at this student and he says, I cannot accept this work. You are doing a disservice to your fellow students in this room. Everyone has taken the personal and moral responsibility to do the hard work and the research. And what have you brought in here for us today? absolutely nothing. He entered the class, he walked out of the class, the door slammed, and he went back to his office and that student received a failing grade for that paper. And I am so thankful that that's what the professor did. But he's an anomaly. Most of the time, people get away with it. Why? Because they're lowering the bar for what takes place in research. Notice this. Peterson goes on to talk about not only are they lowering the bar for research and what actually qualifies as the standards of academic rigor. They're actually lowering the standards for what it takes for an individual to get into these programs. And one thing that's interesting is this, is that if you lower the standards to these top programs and then you expect them to actually operate at that level, we're setting them up for failure. Now let's continue to look at here. Now he goes, all of my Craven colleagues must craft die statements to obtain research grants. Now think about this. All of you who are wanting to go and find funding for your programs, I mean, let's just be honest, there are no research programs without funding. If you don't have money, if you don't have funding, if you don't have a way to actually pay your bills and keep your lights on, you won't be able to go along with your research. And he goes on to say this, they all lie, except the minority of true believers, and they teach their students to do the same. I will tell you this, I have seen the curtain pulled back within these research institutions. And Peterson's correct. They lie. They lie to get the job. They lie when they sign some of these doctrinal statements. They lie when they're filling out these grants. Why? Because they know the dire consequences of if they do not. They can lose their positions. They can be flagged. They can be brushed off to the side. They can become persona non grata. But here's the reality. The emperor has no clothes. People see what's going on. We know exactly what's going on. But as he looks at it, he goes on to say this, and they do it constantly with various rationalizations and justifications, further corrupting what is already a stunningly corrupt enterprise. Recently, I was talking with an individual, PhD graduate, 
under one of the top professors in his field. And he has historically, behind closed doors, been opposed to this entire movement. And we're sitting around, we're talking, and I'm asking him questions. So what are you going to do? What are your ideas for beyond graduation? Do you have any job prospects? And he just kind of admitted in passing, he goes, I'm just going to have to go along with this whole diversity and inclusion and equity program, basically because I want to get a job. And I thought to myself, why are you going to live by lies? Why are you going to bend your knee to this and live your entire life by this? Because the reality is, is that it's not just bend your knee once, it's bend your knee every single day in the classrooms. And it's going to mark the hallmark of your career. It's going to actually determine so much of your career. I would rather say no from the very beginning than know that I'm living a lie. But notice what he goes on to say here. Some of my colleagues even allow themselves to undergo so-called anti-bias training conducted by supremely unqualified human resource personnel, lecturing inanely and blithely and in an accusatory manner about theoretically all-pervasive racist, sexist, heterosexual attitudes. Such training is now often a precondition to, to occupy a faculty position on a hiring committee. Sign the dotted line, toe the line, or you do not have a place in academia today. It's academic segregation. Now he goes on to say this, need I point out that implicit attitudes cannot, by the definition generated by those who have made them a central point of our culture, be transformed by short-term explicit training. As a person cannot be expected to go out and change their entire habits overnight, you cannot go out and expect a person to change their entire implicit attitudes by something just by having them go through your one-hour training or your week-long seminar or your book clubs or the way that they're no longer allowed to have Curious George within their schools or any other thing that's actually going on, which by the way, somebody very closely associated to me received a very nasty letter that worked its way all the way up through because they gave a child a Curious George book as a Christmas present. True story. But notice this. He says, assume that those biases exist in the manner claimed. So let's accept this hypothetical that he's saying here and that it is a very weak claim. And I'm specifically scientific here. The implicit association test, the much vaunted IAT, which purports to objectively diagnose implicit bias and he goes on to talk about, is by no means powerful enough, valid and reliable enough to do what it purports to do. Two of the original designers of the test, and he lists their names, have said such, and they have top research, and they have top qualifications to back up their research here. He says that it's not enough. It's not enough to actually get these implicit biases out of the way. And notice what he goes on to say here. Much of this can be attributed to her overtly leftist political agenda, as well as to her embeddedness within a sub-discipline of psychology and social psychology so corrupt that it denied the existence of left-wing authoritarianism for six decades after World War II. The same social psychologists, broadly speaking, also casually regard conservatism, notice this, in the guise of system justification as a form of psychopathology. So notice this, not only are they trying to make us go through all of these different programs, but they're labeling anybody who poses them as psychopathological figures. Does that make for a healthy work environment? Hey, you disagree with me, you psychopathological freak. Is that the kind of environment that we want to work in, that we want to bring and we want to train our children and expect CEOs to live up to and make businesses and try to have transactions with the in the community? Does that foster the type of environment that you want to live in? I don't think so. Now notice what he goes on to say here. He goes, this individual's continued countenancing of the misuse of her research instrument combined with the status of her position at Harvard is a prime reason we still suffer the under the die yoke with its blatant effect on what was once the closest we had ever come to a truly or meritorious selection. Now, notice what he's trying to say here, the die yoke. And we know what a yoke is. I mean, Jesus even talks about this, take my yoke upon you. Why? Because it's gentle and it's easy. It removes our burdens. Well, this is the opposite. 
This is the Antichrist yoke that's put upon you that brings nothing but burden. It brings no freedom. It brings nothing to the table that's going to give you the liberty that once marked not only Western society, but true life in Christ. Now, one thing that we have to see is, is that a yoke is something that was placed on the neck of cattle as they were trying to plow fields. It was something that was put on there. And if it's too heavy and it draws you down and makes your work and your task difficult. So what are they trying to do with all of these? They're changing all of the standards. It's a, an absolute yoke upon another individual. But notice how they're trying to do this. He goes, there are good reasons to suppose the die vote a motivated eradication of objective testing, such as the GRE for graduate school admissions, will have derelictus effects on the ability of students selected to master such topics as the statistics all social sciences rely upon completely for their validity. Now notice this. Have you seen this? Notice what it is. The GRE exam, the main objective exam that's required to go to graduate school at nearly every institution in the country. And if you look at it, they're dropping like hotcakes everywhere. They initially started out where they were saying, well, due to COVID, we're not going to allow you to uh, submit this because we care about your health or now we're not going to require it. And for some reason, when it left, it never came back. So for all of the people who thought that COVID was going to do away with all of this, it magnified it. It gave it a medical reason to start putting in all of these different dye programs. And what's going to go on is it's not just going to be the GRE. It's going to be the LSTAT. I actually wonder if it's going to go so far as being things such as the bar exam. Maybe, maybe not. I don't see why not. For the exact same thing is what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If you can drop it for entrance exams, why can't you drop it for exit exams? It's simply because we are not there yet. Now he goes on to talk about things related to accreditation. He says, furthermore, the accrediting boards of graduate clinical psychology training programs in Canada are now planning to refuse to accredit university clinical programs unless they have a social justice orientation. And he goes on to talk about what this really looks like, how they're banning things such as conversion to therapy, and how they're going to require you to have certain diversity programs, and that you're going to have to have your syllabi changed within classes, that it's going to have to be a certain number of people hiring at your institution in order for accreditation. Not only is it accreditation, but it's for certain types of federal funding. And what I want to do is I want to just go back to a previous podcast where we talked about the dire effects this had upon one very faithful evangelical institution, Southern Evangelical Seminary, who, as we said in that very podcast, is no longer recognized under what we would say the new agenda coming about even in the United States for people who are going into the chaplaincy, people who are trying to use those funds when they've come out of the military, their GI Bill funds, to receive an education. Why? Because SES is not going along with all of the DIE programs. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, okay, we'll, we'll accept what you've given to us because we're not going to compromise on our convictions, and we're going to use that as a springboard to raise more money for these individuals to provide the exact same type of funding that they would have received as though they were actually getting those funds from our federal government. Think about what he's saying here. Think about the real effects of that. And I'm so thankful for the boldness and the conviction and the courage that they are doing here. But here's the reality. You have to count the cost. And the cost is not only our universities facing the fact that their accreditation and their funding and their placements are being canceled. Evangelical institutions are going to run into the same thing. And that's why for years, evangelicals did not want to have federal funding. But we have, and we have different avenues that we've brought this about, and we're going to suffer the exact same consequences. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Now, notice what he goes on to say. Just exactly what I am supposed to do when I meet a grad, or just exactly what am I supposed to do when I meet a graduate student or young professor hired on die grounds? Manifest instant skepticism regarding their professional ability? What a slap in the face to a truly meritorious young outsider. And perhaps that's the point. The die ideology is not friend to peace and tolerance, it is absolutely and completely the intimate enemy of competence and justice. Now, we've all seen this. This figure comes in and you wonder immediately, why was this individual hired? 
and you look at their CV, they have no publications, they have no past teaching experience, and yet we've hired them. Is that truly based upon merit? And then what are you supposed to do at the water cooler when you're talking to the individual? Are you supposed to just go along to get along? But let's just say the individual is actually hired upon merit, but yet they seem to fulfill these different die grounds and these die criterias. What kind of relationship are you going to have with this individual? I mean, what is he going to say? Are you just supposed to live in manifest instant skepticism regarding the professional ability? Does that create a healthy work environment? No. That's why when you look at all of these different, you know, bias trainings and all these different things and you sit down and you have Bob and John sit there and John admits to his friend Bob, yes, I'm white. And he laments his whiteness and his implicit bias and racist. And his friend Bob looks back at him and says, bud, we've been friends for years. I've gone to your family, different events. I've been at your kids' birthday parties. We've spent time together. We've, we've sat around the table together and you've been a racist this whole time. Is that the kind of thing that you want to actually bring to your workplace? Because that's exactly what it does bring to the workplace is that a person either has to say and admit and somehow lament their implicit bias and systemic racism against the individual or deny it. But if they deny it, their white fragility is coming to place and somehow they're admitting their racism by denying their racism. And you know the yada, yada, yada way that they put this forward. Now, let's continue going through here. He talks about this isn't just something in the academy. This is all over Hollywood. We do not need any more examples. We don't need to look at every single one of these because they are literally everywhere. He goes on to talk about how this has affected media. There's no hiding the fact there. We all realize that the media has been affected by this. And he goes on to say, CBS, for example, has literally mandated that every writer's room be at least 40% BIPOC in 2021 and 50% in 2022. That's a clear example of what's going on. He goes also to say, we're now at the point where race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual preference is first accepted as the fundamental characteristic defining each person just as the radical leftists were hoping, and second, is now treated as the most important qualification for study, research, and employment. That's why when we talk about this, it's almost like it's got this, this um, witch's brew, this Pied Piper effect on individuals that are going on, that this is the most manifest, important thing that you bring to the table. You've been exposed to diversity, inclusion, and equity training. Somehow you have special insights to reality. You know, in previous decades and centuries, we would have called this a form of Gnosticism. And this is exactly what it is. It's an ethnic form of Gnosticism by which individuals somehow have special knowledge into all of the research fields, into the sciences, into math, into individuals, into sociology, into history and all the rest. And they are now these beacons of truth who are enlightening the paths of people in these areas. But here's the whole point. Race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual preference are not modes of cognition. That's why I always give this example of what I call the hundred and one man argument. And here's how it kind of goes. You have 50 people in one room and 50 people in another. But we could also say that there's something different about one of these rooms. There's something manifestly, namely the collective insight of the whole, the sociology of knowledge of all the people that are in there. So what might that extra one person be? Race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual preference. Somehow there's a group think that's brought to the table amongst all of them that gives them a collective greater insight into the reality of what's going on. How racist, sexist, and bigoted could that be to say that you must think, act, and behave in one particular way, simply because of your race, gender, ethnicity, or sexual preference. The fact is, is that that individual, that extra 101 or 101st person is not an actual person. These collective groups don't have collective minds. There's no such thing as something that has justified true belief or knowledge in that collective sense. 
Now, you do have groups that can believe certain things, but there's no such thing as just a group knowledge like that. Now, as Christians, I think one thing that we need to see here is, is that the most fundamental thing about a person is not their race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual preference. It's the fact that they're made in the image of God. And what that brings is that they bear not only rationality because of that, but they also have the other manifest characteristics that come along with the image of God. Value, inherent dignity given to them because of that characteristic. But what it also does is it makes the fact that each individual has that inherent value. They can bring something to the table because of that inherent value that goes much deeper, much broader, and much more significant eternally for not only that person, but all of humanity. Now he goes on to say, need I point out that this is insane? Think about this. The insanity that this is bringing to scholarship. He says, even the New York Times has its doubt. He says, a headline from August 11th, 2021, are workplace diversity programs doing more harm than good? In a word, yes. How can accusing your employees of racism sufficient to require retraining, particularly in relationship to those who are working in good faith to overcome whatever bias they might st still in those modern liberal times manifest be anything other than insulting, annoying, invasive, high-handed, moralizing, inappropriate, e ill-considered, counterproductive, and otherwise unjustifiable. And I would add the same, that this goes on within evangelical institutions. And he says, and if you think die is bad, wait until you get a load of environmental, social, and governance scores. And what this is, is this is going to be your social credit score. As we're coming into the sort of new society that's coming about, if you're a business owner and your board doesn't have enough diversity hires, you are either not going to get a loan or if you do get a loan, you will get it at a significantly higher interest rate. One that's going to become such a burden upon you that it's not going to be worth actually taking out the loan pay to play, in other words. Now, notice what he goes on to say here. He talks about how this is related to the, the Chinese acts and what they're actually doing in that country and how it's manifestly the same, just coming along in a different avenue in the United States. That's why Ronald Reagan was right. If fascism or socialism ever came to the United States, it was going to come through the left. And this is exactly the avenue by which it's coming. Now, notice what he goes on to say here. He starts to ask these these different questions. He says, CEOs, what in the world is wrong with you? Can't you see that the ideologues who push such appalling nonsense are driven by an agenda that is not only absolutely antithetical to your free market enterprise as such, but precisely targeted at the freedoms that made your success possible? Can't you see that by going along sheep-like, just as professors are doing, just as the artists and writers are doing, that you are generating a veritable fifth column within your business. Are you really so blind, cowed, and cowardly what, with all of your so-called privilege? Do you not realize that as you go along with this, it's going to utterly destroy the business you sacrificed your life building? There is no way that this is going to make a healthy work environment in which you have the funds to operate, the employees who are working towards the exact same goal with the right end and telos for your business. And he goes on to say, this isn't just universities. He, and he says, and the professional colleagues in Hollywood and the corporate world, diversity, inclusion, and equity, the radical leftist trinity. Think about this. You have the trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but yet there's also been many diabolical trinities throughout the years. And what he's trying to say here is this, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Your three different persons with one goal, which is to, instead of saving humanity, is to utterly corrupt humanity and send it into an ideological hell of which we cannot get away from. And he goes on to say this, it's destroying us. The, the tempter, the individual, the, the true Satan, the one who has come up against all of humanity, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's exactly what this ideology is doing to our society. 
notice this. It says, wondering about the divisiveness that is currently be besetting us? Look no further than die. Wondering more specifically about the attractiveness of Trump? Look no further than die. You want to understand the Trump effect? I'll tell you what the Trump effect is. Most people don't believe this. Rural America in particular does not believe this. And one of the things that you have to find is that these social elites, the Washington insiders, they think that all people think like them. But I'm here to tell you people, we don't. We think you're nuts. We think you're insane. We don't believe this stuff. We don't buy along with this stuff. It says, when does the left go too far? Right here. When they worship at the altar of die and insist that the rest of us who mostly want to be left alone do so as well. Enough already. Enough. And as Jordan Peterson says, enough. We can't keep going along with this. Now, here's the interesting thing is that he starts to talk about how Vladimir Putin recently did an entire interview and he talks about us, the United States in the West. And he talks about how Marx and Engels have already given this to Russia and other countries, sort of been there, done that, been there, been burned by that, the full effects of what it's bringing. And he goes on to say, as they're quoting here, and this is what he says, this I believe should call to mind some of what we are witnessing now. Look at what is happening in a number of Western countries. We are amazed to see the domestic practices, which we, talking about Russia, fortunately have left, I hope, in the distant past. The fight for equality and against discrimination has turned into aggressive dogmatism bordering on absurdity. When the works of the great authors of the past, such as Shakespeare, are no longer taught at schools or universities because their ideas are believed to be backward. The classics are declared backward and ignorant of the importance of gender or race. In Hollywood, memos are dis distributed about proper storytelling and how many characters of what color or gender should be in a movie. This is even worse than the agapropped department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. We're worse than the Russians. But just think about this. Think about what's going on here. If you're an individual who teaches in disciplines that I do, namely I'm a philosophy professor, and philosophy is deemed in many respects white Western male. It is giving objective notions of truth and logical thinking and validity and invalidity, and we test things and we're, we're difficult to work with because we want to have things rational and so on and so forth. Well, just think about this. If you're letting these diversity programs into your institution, you are literally handing them the rope that's going to hang your department. I, I, I will tell you this very clearly. The, the departments that are going to go first are the ones that stand opposed to this unless they bend their knee to it. And that's exactly what's going on. You have individuals who will have to sit before their academic deans and they review your syllabi and they say, well, I don't think you have enough uh, diversity representations here and you don't have enough minority authors here and you don't have enough global impact that's being brought about. So you need to change your whole syllabi, make new lectures, teach the way that we want you to teach. And if you do not, you're going to be sidelined. How do I know? I've seen it happen at evangelical schools. I've received the emails. I've actually had those conversations of which I gave a frank no, and I continue to go along with it. Now, look at what he goes on to say here. This from the head of the former totalitarian enterprise against whom we fought a five decades long cold war, risking the entire planet in a very real manner. This is from the head of a country riven in a literally genocidal manner by ideas that Putin himself attributes to the progressives in the West, to the generally accepting audience of his once burned, once twice shy listeners. Notice what he's going on to say. And all of you going along with the die activists, whatever your reasons, this is on you. The history books will report what's going on. And what it's going to show is that certain people just went along with it. Peterson's right. This is on you, professors, cowering cravenly in pretense and silence. Sometimes it's this. If you would have spoken up early, you maybe would have had an influence on this, but now you've waited too long. 
That's why we talk about this. At least some of us that sit around are people who are hidden and discussing these things and open and yet trying to look at them who are crazy. We call it a Frankenstein movement. You've created a monster. You've released him into your institutions and you said nothing about it. And now you can't get rid of it. Because if you do, you know that the Washington Post and the New York Times and all the different liberal media outlets are going to absolutely slaughter you on their websites and in their news programs and all over social media. Whereas if you would have dealt with it early on, you maybe would have had a fighting chance. Let me give you an example. Um, I'm a practitioner of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And one of the things that you'll find within Brazilian jiu-jitsu is that, yeah, you can get out of very hard and difficult places, but sometimes it's just better to not allow yourself to get in that position in the first place. For example, we give this, this uh, illustration a lot of times. People will get you in what's known as the rear naked choke, the mata leon, as they would say, uh, which is the lion killer, where you wrap one arm around their neck and it comes in and you get, you get the stroke on them. And inevitably, students are getting caught in it and they ask, sir, how, 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 can I, how can I get out of this? And the reality is, sometimes you can't. You needed to fight it before you got in there. That's the way that you deal with the situation. You head it off before you even get there. And notice what he goes on to say here. Teaching your students to dissimulate and lie, to get along. As the walls crumble, for shame. CEO signaling a virtue you don't possess and shouldn't want to please a minority who literally live their lives by displeasure. You're evil capitalists, after all, and should be proud of it. At the moment, I can't tell if you're more reprehensibly timid even than the professors. Think about this. The almighty dollar determines what so many of these CEOs do. They're absolutely frightened by the fact that somebody might cancel their subscription. And he goes on to say, why the hell don't you banish the human resource die upstarts back to the more appropriately named personnel departments? Stop them from interfering with the psyches of you and your employees and be done with it. Think about this. People are absolutely paranoid as can be today. You ever thought about it? If you're wondering, am I racist? Is this person going to turn me in? Am I not going to have a job tomorrow? Am I somehow denigrating the person next to me? You get crazy over it. And then you wonder if other people are doing this. You'll drive yourself insane with what's going on. Why don't we just rid it and have a normal workplace? Why don't we just make the fact that we don't want the most difficult thing that we face in our day-to-day -day life is wondering about the unexpressed, unintentional cognitive biases that the person before me is trying to express day in and day out. And he goes on to say this, musicians and artists and writers, stop bending your sacred and meritorious art to the demands of the propagandists before you fatally betray the spirits of your own intuition. Stop censoring your thought. Stop saying you will hire for your orchestral and theatrical productions for any reason other than talent and excellence. That's all you have. That's all any of us have. He who sows to the wind will reap the whirlwind, and the wind is rising. And the fact is, the wind has been rising for decades. It's been around for a long time. And we on the West have to stand up to this movement. Stand now. Stand together. Stand strong or none of us will be able to stand in the future. And that's exactly what he's trying to say here is he who sows the wind will reap the whirlwind. But if you resist this wind, if you resist this movement, this rising movement that's coming, if we reject by principle to live by lies, I think we have a fighting chance. Now, this is one thing that I want to say in particular. There are a lot of people today who are incredibly pessimistic. In fact, I can be incredibly pessimistic. By, by natural disposition, I'm a pessimist. But when I read the text of Scripture, I have to be an optimist. I realize that in the Bible itself, we find the principles that can help us get out of this quagmire, that can give us rational coherence to defeat these ideological enemies. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ calls us to do. We demolish all arguments that raise themselves up against the knowledge of Christ. We take every thought captive. We live by the renewing of our minds. But you have to be people of conviction. 
And one thing that I want us to realize is this, and I will finish on this. There are two fears in life, the fear of God and the fear of man. Never, never, never let the fear of man trump your fear of God. Stand for the truth. Stand for that which is good, true, and the beautiful. Thank you.